it's it's just, just different. different. Welcome to Sister Saving Sisters podcast, conversations that heal, impacting lives through conversations that heal the soul. Sharing my personal cancer journey as I dig deep and unpacked experiences rarely talked about. Hey, I'm your host, Dr. Nicole Robinson. Let's pull up and talk. No matter how you feel, maybe you have been Welcome to Sisters Saving Sisters podcast. My name is Dr. Nicole Robinson. I am so excited about today. This is the first podcast for Sisters Saving Sisters podcast. I'm really excited about this conversation I'm about to have with this amazing sister that I have with me, Simone Kilgore. She's a trauma therapist. And today's topic, what we're going to be talking about is suffering in silence. And for those of you who may not know, I'm actually a stage four metastatic breast cancer patient. I consider myself a thriver because I'm thriving through this thing right now. And for those of you who also don't know, metastatic breast cancer is cancer that has spread to different parts of the body. For me, my breast cancer, when it came back stage four, it spread to the bone in my back, the clavicle in my neck and my left chest wall. But if I have to say, God is good, because I'm here to share with you some of my experiences that I go through as a survivor, as a cancer patient, but also I want to talk about my mental battles and my stressors that I deal with when dealing with cancer. And so I have with me today this sister who's going to talk with us and we're just going to unpack some things. We're just going to talk about some issues. I'm going to tell her about some of my things that I consider the thorns in my side or other words, triggers but I consider them my thorns because they're my mental battles. And I call them my highs and lows. And it took me a long time for me to just admit sometimes that I was battling depression. So I have this sister, Simone Kilgore, here with me. If I could just say hello first. Hi. Hi. (laughs) I love you. I'm so glad that you invited me here. I'm excited for this conversation. Man, I'm so excited because... The Lord put you in my spirit to do this thing. And so this is just an organic and how it's developing. And I'm so happy. And I didn't even know you were a trauma therapist. It's crazy. (laughs) It's crazy how it came together because we've known each other for so long. And I know where you are on the coast. You know I'm here. And we have a love thing we always have since we met. But I think when God gave you me and me, you, he meant that. Yeah, it's absolutely. Purposeful. Absolutely. Yeah, it always has been. It has been. And I'm just glad how it's developed. I love Wait, it. I read an article about you. And in this article, it was talking about behind the chair. Yes. Right? Yes. So before I actually go into it, can I just read to the audience just some of your just killer experience, <laughs> sure. some of the things that you do and have done? Because I was like, floored, like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. So, okay. So I'm just going to be real, you know, just give it to them real hard. (laughs) So this beautiful sister that I have with us today, that's going to lead us through this conversation, Simone Kilgore, formerly Stovall. She has been providing therapeutic care for survivors. I'm so glad to know this is near and dear to her. She's not new to breast cancer. So let me just give you a little bit. Simone is a licensed professional counselor. She focused mainly on neurobiology of trauma. I don't even know what that is, okay? (laughs) (laughs) We're going to get into some of that. Okay, all right, okay. (laughs) Trauma-informed care, trauma-specific interventions, community trauma, okay? Culturally specific outreach, mindfulness, self-compassion, self-care. I think I'm going to call this series Mm self-care, right? Mm Self-care and self-love, all right? So Simone, she is actually an adjunct professor. She has a master's degree in community psychology. She's a graduate from Alverno College. She has facilitated so many conversations when it comes to trauma therapy and just therapeutic groups. She is a consultant She's done work with Children's Hospital, Milwaukee Public Schools, 
I mean, Milwaukee Office of Violence Prevention, local churches, groups. I mean, I even met her through when I lived in Milwaukee, through my church family. Yes. And so we work with the youth. Yes, and we did. my love for you, I used to always just watch you from a distance yeah. and how you dealt with youth, yeah. right? So when this concept came to mind, I thought about, we did a retreat. You don't remember. Mm-mm. We did a retreat with the youth. And you were speaking to, I can't even recall the topic, but when I watched how you were talking to our youth, they were just captivated. You had them pulled in, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But every time we always felt this comfort that we could just come to you and talk to you about anything. And I'm not even doing any justice in reading your bio, but I want to encourage people to look at my Facebook page, Hats for Hearts. And just read about Simone's bio. We'll post it again. This is amazing, sister. And I'm just happy to start this conversation off. And so just tell us a little bit about you. Okay. A little bit more. Yes. I just want to say thank you again for the invitation. And thank you to Podcast Town for having us here. It's a beautiful space. And we're really grateful and thankful for this time. I'm humbled, like overwhelmed with joy and glee. I just want to do whatever God's will is. That's the truth. Nobody lives in a state of perfection, but I feel like I'm very clear about what I'm supposed to be doing on the planet. Like, I've never really questioned it. In terms of finding a specific title, job, or career, I wasn't always clear, but I was always clear about connecting to people. I always knew from a child that's what I wanted to do. And it's, I won't say easy, but it's like my skin. It's like breathing for me to connect, to feel people's emotions. And for years, I was overwhelmed with that. Like, didn't know what to do with that. Feeling people's pain or trauma or needs. And it can be taxing until I learned how to deal with it and how to separate it and how to assist without harming myself. So I've learned that over the years, but I've always been a person who wanted to connect and help others. So did you always know that you would be involved with trauma or become a trauma therapist? Not at all. Not at all. I knew in the sixth grade I would be a salon owner and a therapist (laughs) one day. I knew that. But when I thought about therapy that young, I didn't think of it from a trauma standpoint. I didn't understand the word trauma. It wasn't as fluent as it is now for one. But even as I became an adult in the salon, because I'm a licensed cosmetologist as well, I worked with so many women, so many sisters and men who would come in and share trauma. Yeah. So you're like counseling. I promise. And at the time, I didn't recognize it as counseling. Sometimes it was just what we call attentively listening. When you attentively listen, you listen to not respond, but to hear, to listen, to be present. And people know when you're present and they know when you're not. If they're paying attention to the space and the energy and what's happening. And behind the chair, based on that article you read, I learned how to be present, how to attentively listen without responding oftentimes responding and providing resources and information I had learned from the client before or the day before. And so my years in the salon really set me up for my education in therapy or in psychology and the degree in licensing and so on and so forth. I just think God knew. He knows. Absolutely. And it just worked out that way. Absolutely. Because I can think about it was therapy even then when I think about when you I listened to you Mm -hmm. talking to you. It's just such a passion there. It is. And I had always found it easy. And thank you, like, even when I was first diagnosed with cancer, breast cancer in 2014, you have always been my support system, right? Even though you live far, you traveled. You don't know how much that meant to me. We came to see you. You traveled to support me when I put on my first wig. Yes, we came to see you. So just unpacking that and... So even when I was re-diagnosed in 2018, I don't think we ever really talked about it or I shared. Mm-hmm. I was devastated, I right? Mm-hmm. When they said stage four, because I was all like, 
God, like, why me? Like, I mean, and I know that thing is like, why not you? Yeah. So I'm like, what do you want me to do with this? That wasn't my first thought, though. No, man. I was <laughs> like, I was crushed. Yeah. I was all like, yeah. how? Like, I'm going to be here tomorrow? Or is it? It was just so devastating. And it took me back to when I was first diagnosed because you know, I kind of like pushed everything aside to just go through the treatment, right? Yes. So I didn't really deal with my emotions then. So not until after I was done with treatment, I was like, wow, I just went through this. I just yes. had chemo. I just had surgery. Yes. And so then to revisit stage four, mm-hmm. I was like, oh, my gosh. A more serious diagnosis. A second time around, my body fought through it, which is amazing. The human body, the makeup of the body, the brain how we process the blood flow, everything, how we get through these things and then to hear it again and again and again. And I think that's why this conversation is so important because people hear traumatic things over and over and over and will not address the emotions. Sometimes that is the best thing for us. I always tell people don't get caught up in not addressing your emotions sooner or not seeking therapy sooner or asking for support sooner. However it played out, it perfectly played out so we could get here. It's something that you say that because it just leans into the topic, suffering in silence. Yeah, yeah. Because I have been a master at hiding behind. People would never know I had cancer. They would never know I'm in treatment. And so when I have to go, to, like I actually had treatment yesterday before I came. And so people would never know. And it's like when I get ready to go to treatment, it's like my reminder, like any other time I'm walking through this thing, I'm like, oh, I'm good. But when I have to go to treatment, it's like my reminder, like, are oh, you still battling this thing? So it puts me in this place. And not until a few months back, I really came to grips like I need to really talk to somebody about this thing. because. I called it my highs and lows. Mm -hmm. I heard you. And it's like, (laughs) I I mean, I'll meditate. I'm engulfed in prayer. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it can be unbearable. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about that. What we've learned, specifically as women of color, as Black women in our 40s, 50s, understanding what we saw from our mothers and grandmothers who dealt with the same battles, if not harsher, and the way that they navigated that. Many times I didn't know what my mom was going through. I had no clue. It wasn't until I became a woman and I could understand some of the things she was saying, maybe about a doctor's appointment or diagnosis or bills or stress or the roof on the house. I just thought growing up, eh. That's adult stuff, but at the same time to understand the multiple layers that come with a diagnosis of anything. You not only physically worry about yourself, which we kind of put on the back burner as Black women mothers, right? But your job, your children, your grandchildren, your pets, literally your pets, who's going to mop today because I can't. I ain't been able to mop in six months. You know what I'm saying? So it's just the things that people don't understand if they haven't gone through that type of diagnosis or issue that we take for granted. The ability to get up and feel okay when you stand 10 toes down, not lightheaded, not sick to the stomach, not nauseated, not confused, not sad. It's a sadness. It's a persistent sadness that it's like a coding. And then for work, You have to take it off because you have to work. You got to eat. And at the doctor, you try to listen and stay positive and remember everything they say by yourself until your family and friends are okay when you're not. It's a sad space. And I'm so, again, appreciative for the invitation because I can feel it now. I just don't want people to suffer like that. You just don't have to be alone in anything. Isn't that like trauma? It is trauma, period, period. A diagnosis of cancer, breast cancer, twice, Yeah. stage four. You've experienced trauma, sister. 
You want me to say it out loud? It has taken me a lot to admit that. Yes. Right? Because what is that about for us? That we can't. Right. Or we won't. We I've won't. been there. Oh. When I say we, that means all of us collectively. It takes time to process. The brain is so phenomenal. I always tell people it's delicious because we're designed to have things happen, even as children, good and bad. I like to say good and not so good. (laughs) Because I think bad puts us in a space where we categorize and some things can be horrific, but good and not so good because our brain categorizes things in a way that it should go. And we have like a card catalog system where we have memories that come up and they make sense, age five, age 10, 16, 20. But then when there's trauma involved, the brain is a little different. I'm not going to be too scientific, but it hides things that we can't deal with. Exactly. Because it's that delicious, right? I can't deal with hearing. Stage four. So I will go to every appointment. I will do exactly what they say. I will go to work. I'll tell my mom and my family and my husband and my partners, and I'll tell them tomorrow. And then tomorrow turns into two weeks, three weeks, because you can't even verbally say it out loud. Your brain has caused you just to deal with it internally, alone, in the bathroom, on the toilet, in the shower, watching TV, driving you. So yet when I say my highs and lows, I get in this dark space. And so even in our community, like I said, I've tried a lot of things. I meditate. I do a lot of different things to try to stay positive and keep me out that space. But I thought even when trying to pull together this, this is my God project, right? I was just like, how do we share with people? Like even in our community. So before even talking to you, I was like, how can I share with somebody if I haven't even sought counseling myself? So the amazing thing, I have to say that I actually had my first session a few weeks ago. Yay. So and <laughs> so it was hard to, because in our community, we don't like to admit. Uh-huh. We don't talk about. We don't. We don't talk about therapy. We push it and we keep moving. Black women in particular, and I'm talking about research based and what I've seen and what we know, we deal with weight. We are weight carriers of our stuff and other people's stuff. And we're going to handle it. We're going to handle it for them. And we don't believe that anybody is capable of helping us handle our. And I don't know if it's a belief or a fear. Because for me in particular, I think it's a fear of if I allow Nicole to help me carry this load, I don't have time for her to let me down. So I just won't tell her. I just won't ask it because I can't deal with one more thing. And so with a diagnosis, seeking support and help, and then people can't come through for me, that would break me, not showing up for me. So I'll just keep it to myself and just keep pushing, right? It's not necessarily a shame. So if some people associate it with a shame or a stigma at times, and sometimes it's that, but not always. Sometimes it's just, I can't be bothered with somebody letting me down. I got too much on my plate. I don't want people to have like a pity party. Or a pity party. Right? Or be like, you okay? Yeah. Like, no, don't hit me with that. But what's that about, (laughs) right? I mean, like, it's so funny. So when I mentioned that I had stage four and I kind of like put it on Facebook or something like that, put it on social media, and I had people reach out to me, I mean... You hadn't communicated otherwise, but it was like, I'm okay. Even dealing with my son, it was like, he thought it was my death sentence, right? And for many, that's how they might look at it, right? So is it levels to trauma? Are there different levels to trauma? Yes. Yeah. So I like that that's a a question that you wanted to kind of delve into. We talk about, and they say simple trauma versus complex trauma or the complexities. And so we know that complex trauma, and sometimes you can associate it with children, is multiple levels or layers. So it could be abuse in the home, neglect, lack of food, lack of resources and support, lack of safety. And so that's a complexity. It's complex trauma. It's not just one situation or one issue. Even car accidents, that could be a complex or a simple trauma. 
from a car accident or a divorce. But we know the complexities within divorce. You see what I'm saying? The shame, the guilt, the stigma. You know, how do we divide properties, kids, money, whatever. So to me, even if it's a single event, that is complexity in the single traumatic event. But more than one event, right? So through your diagnosis, the first and the second time, other things happen in your life. And so it seems like if it snows too hard, I'm just taking that real personal on a day that I'm not feeling great or the trauma is at its most high today. I'm feeling overwhelmed or at my lowest point. I feel depression setting in. I'm trying to fight it, that kind of thing. But yes, there's different types of trauma, sometimes single incidents, sometimes multiple incidents, but all of it can be very convoluted and complex. Now, can you recognize like someone who, like your conversations behind the chair, are you able to recognize when somebody is just talking to you, like, are they like screaming out, like, I need some help? Can you recognize it? And when you recognize it, how do you kind of like say, have you talked to anybody? Or is that like on a slippery slope that you can't? Not necessarily slippery because I hear from God, period. and. I'm courageous in that. So sometimes, especially in the salon, if I feel something, I'll say something. And the sisters I work with is like, okay, Mom, not today, you know. (laughs) I'll start that today. (laughs) And I say, okay. (laughs) Not today, but sometimes it's, I can't help it. I just want to say something to the person who's expressing themselves to remind them that hope is always available. Always. I believe that as long as you are breathing, there's hope. So do you think therapy actually, because some people in our community, they don't think they really need to talk to Mm -hmm. anybody or there's this shame associated with it. Mm -hmm. I think therapy is a gateway to hope. I think it's a gateway. I think if you take the risk of calling a therapist and setting an appointment, that makes you courageous. Showing up, you're brave. Sitting there, just listening. You've conquered it. You took the risk. You made it through. You exit the therapy session, whether you thought it was great or not. You've already worked down some of that angst associated with the risk. It's risky to say, I want to go into a space and kind of open up myself to learning myself more. Because that's all therapy is. People really have it screwed up thinking, absolutely. It has nothing to do with the therapist. And people think, I don't want this person judging me. I don't want this person diagnosing me. The term diagnosis bothers people. I'm diagnosed with high blood pressure and I just hate it. Like, I I don't want to be, right? (laughs) As if there's some kind of mark on me. And it's not. It's not. I don't know how many, you know, they have different support groups for cancer patients. I've never participated in really to be able to share. I've always just fueled it in another area, mm-hmm. like giving. Mm-hmm. Right? It's you like, started right That's away. my outlet. Can you talk about ads for her a little bit? Because sure. you started that. <laughs> I feel we found out about your diagnosis. We came to you. I just needed to hug you. I just needed to see you. And you gave us that smile. And I knew, I knew then I wasn't a therapist at the time. And that's always been my thing too. I just could not help from feeling the emotions. One of my greatest mentors here, Dr. Juliet Martin Thomas, told me years ago, I was doing her hair. She said, you're a carrier. And I said, what? What's what's that? that? (laughs) You're a carrier, which means that you can feel the energy that's in the space and you can feel it and you carry other people's emotion. Wow, that's heavy. You need to very much learn what to do with that. And I was like, okay. (laughs) I think I was talking to her about a guy who had harmed his family in a horrific way, murdered. And I was sad for the family. Sad for the family, extremely, extremely. But I was so sad for him. 
And I was angry at myself because I didn't understand why did I feel so heavy? The heaviness and the sadness associated with him going to prison the rest of his life and dealing with my major issue was him dealing with what he had caused. I just didn't want him to have to deal with what he had caused. It like overwhelmed me. And she said, I said, I do this all the time, but this is too much. And that's when she explained it to me. And it made in the moment, you have somebody says something to you and it makes sense in that moment. I didn't have to process it. When she said it, I said, okay. I was that my whole life. My mom would always say, Simone, why are you crying? What does it matter? <laughs> and I'd say, well, they won't play with Nicole at recess. And she'd say, well, did they play with you? Mm-hmm. But they didn't play with Nicole and I can't take it. Like I would just, I can't take it. And so she said, okay, I need you to wipe your eyes and stop crying. You play with Nicole. But like, that's the beautiful I had thing to learn about you. <laughs> that's the beautiful thing about you. Yeah. Your heart, right? Yeah. And how you care for someone. Yeah, it's real. Because I just thought, God, they just drove from Milwaukee. We meant it. We meant it. To come and be with me. We meant it. I just teared up. Yeah, oh, me too. Oh, <laughs> that's okay. So I started Hats for Hearts when I was diagnosed, mm-hmm. or as you know, in 2014 yeah. with stage two breast cancer. And it was a God gift. I wanted to do something to give back. So I started collecting hats and headwear for chemo patients losing yeah. their hair. So you guys bought down hats and yeah. everybody bought in wigs and we had this event. Yeah. And it kind of just, excuse my tears. It's okay. It kind of just birthed kind of like, it's really my ministry for real. Yeah. You know, yes. all, in all honesty. Yeah. Right. And so it's turned into breast health. We do an annual mammogram event. Yeah. I wish I could really do more, right? You do events, though. You've had celebrities there. You've had people come dressed up like a (laughs) night out to raise money and awareness. Like, this is massive. I remember you sending me drawings. Oh, my gosh. Of what we could do to make wigs for people. And I was like, whatever. What you want to (laughs) do? Like, you were just... Happen. So wait a minute, let me tell you about that. So I submitted my drawing, yeah. right? I wanted to get it patented. I so remember. We, and they were like, you can't submit this. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, right. And now everybody is making everybody these Everybody is wigs. making these wigs. And, and I, you talked about it a, lo- a while ago, a I, long I, time I would, ago. I can remember when I had lost all of my hair. Yeah. And I wasn't really fashioning towards wigs. So I had sewn into a hairnet some hair yes. around the sides. Yes. And I had my hat on. So to kind of like, but if I took it off, so it was kind of, it was. I remember. <laughs> but just coming up with ideas to help you feel like you. Because you don't. Because I mean, you don't. Yeah. It's like, I kind of, in some, some sense, I thought I had lost who I was because when I had to have my surgery and had a portion of my breast removed. So to look at myself in the mirror, I'm all like on my body, like feeling attractive or even when it comes down to your intimate wear, right? So you go to the lingerie store, a breast cancer patient, there's not always a lot of, you know, cool, this. So just feeling good about yourself. So that's why when I had my events, and wanted to do this thing, uh, Bold and Confident You. I really just wanted to celebrate cancer patients. And it'd be a night that they dress up yeah. and they strut their stuff on the runway, right? Just celebrating them, yeah. right? Yeah. So that that's another guy I get. That's how you, to kind of go into what you talked about with stigma. Yeah. That's how you reduce it. You create hats for hearts. You create events. You talk about it. You allow people to strut their stuff. Yeah. Because we're here. (laughs) Yeah. We're here. We're still here. Because you get lost. You get lost in what you feel you look like and what you feel you sound like in the diagnosis, in the fear of. So the fear of anything, any trauma, it's overwhelming. It overwhelms you. It takes your breath. So how do you really, like, I know my own craziness and how I cope. Mm. But that might not be the best way in coping, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So how do we share with somebody to say how you really go about to cope? Or like, because I've even pushed loved ones away and me trying to deal. And this is really so sad because like if I hear somebody saying, 
my mom, if she hears it, she's going to kill me. <laughs> so let's just talk okay. about my mom. So my mom, she's in a, a senior place. But sometimes when I hear people like really hard to say when they're battling things, mm-hmm. this is really bad. Forgive me. Forgive me, audience. I feel like, how can you? You don't have cancer. How can you complain? Say it. Say it. Please say it. It's like, you know, when I hear somebody talking about, yeah, I don't have and I'm not doing and I don't. And I'm like, you don't have a clue. I'm like, you don't have cancer. Yeah. And so that's probably a little bit. No, it's so transparent. I'm so glad you shared it because it's so real. When I'm caught up in my trauma, when I'm dealing with my trauma, when I have dealt with my trauma in the past, trauma has a way of blinding you. It's like you can't see anything but the trauma and how it relates to you. I can talk to other people who have stage four and I can hear their story and I can understand I am not alone in the diagnosis. Within that, you still feel very alone. You just do. And I just want to tell people the truth about our work specifically, mostly every day with survivors of sexual assault and domestic violence. But of course, the community trauma is always homicide, suicide, arson, neglect, just stuff that's happening in our cities and communities. But even in that, no matter how many people lose their son or how many children are being trafficked, nobody's story is exactly like the other. Nobody. And so you do have a right to that. Sometimes I feel bad. You have a right to that. (laughs) But at the same time, Don't feel bad, but understand, yes, they don't have cancer. So they don't have a clue about cancer. But you might not have a clue about what it feels like to be in a senior building with diabetes and having to eat something that somebody else is preparing or having a neighbor or sleeping in a space you don't quite remember or looking back at a time when you had more independence. You don't know that. There's so many levels. Now you're saying that, like you're saying trafficking. The people might not understand that but they do understand their own type of suffering and what it meant for them. And so in that, we can share. One of the things we talk about is there's no hierarchy of pain. So what do you mean when there's no hierarchy of pain? So we learn as trauma therapists that oftentimes, especially in group therapy, which we do quite a bit of work with survivors who are surviving and thriving, right? Mm -hmm. Doing better on their path and are encouraged to be in groups where they can hear other people and not so much of the facilitator or the therapist, but from other survivors to get suggestions or ideas or to talk about how we process emotions. How do we regulate? Because the regulation. I'm writing that down. (laughs) Regulate emotions. Yes, it's serious. Without (laughs) regulation, we all might be quite messy because you have to figure out how to bring that in and make sense of it. And I think for many of us, that suffer in silence. We bring it in, but we don't process it. We bring it in and we hold it for life. We hold on to it tight. Sometimes I'm in session with people and I'll say, you can release your hand. So wait, do you notice? I feel it first. And so it could be their hands or it could be their stomach. It could be their breath. It could be in their idea, no matter what she says, I'm not going there today. Wow. And I'm like, cool, because I respect the boundary. So how do you break that down to like, so me just starting my journey in therapy, right? Mm -hmm. And so when they had my first consultation, they said, a therapy is like dating. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It was like, if one therapist doesn't work, find you another another one. one. (laughs) I say it every day. (laughs) If this is not a comfortable situation for you, there's things that you can say to me and you have a right to so that we can make adjustments. If those adjustments are not to your liking, then you can choose to say, Simone, you know what? I'm going to end this and try to find somebody else. I can help you with suggestions. I can connect you with someone else. My job is to make sure that the person feels that therapy is the route and that not Simone. I'm not the route. So trying to separate the therapist and the patient? Trying to create space where there's equality, equity in the space, and where they're comfortable. And so I say a lot to incoming new therapists, sometimes I'm doing things backwards, which means for (laughs) me, I follow the rules where I work. Let me say that. And I follow the rules based on the state and my license. 
all the time. Yeah. But I also don't believe that the first couple of sessions have to be about paperwork and diagnosis. And I want clients that I serve to know me. And I don't mind that. And that doesn't mean personal stuff, personal space. It means what it feels like to be in a room with Simone for a 45 to 55 minute session. What it feels like to say something you have never said to anyone ever before and know that it's not alarming to me or scary or upsetting or that I'm judging. How do you begin to, when you're dealing, we're in our suffering and silence mode, where do we have to be mentally in our space to open up or to begin to open up or how do we start it? That's so good. I think when you first asked me about this, I was thinking about how do people start it? And oftentimes for me, it is with people I share that until they can have hope for themselves, I'll hold it. I'll have the hope. And sometimes people are like, oh my goodness, they love it. And sometimes folks are like, what? Because there's not a belief that they can heal. They just don't believe it. They don't believe that they can get past this. It's just like the biggest lump in their throat and I cannot breathe. It took my breath, right? And so I want people to learn their bodies, how to bring the breath back, how to process through things, how to talk to themselves. And so we start out all the time with self-care techniques. How do you take care of yourself? Grounding, meditation, prayer, exercise, talking to other people, writing, journaling, singing, artistic stuff. Hats for hearts, self-care, that's self-care. And so when you do that, you create something that when the really tough stuff comes up for you in therapy and out of therapy, you have something to reach for. So if I'm not in therapy, okay. Mm -hmm. It could be meditation. It could be be hats for hearts, which was your thing, whether you know it or not. That was your go-to self-care in that moment. Yours was get busy. It was. Yours is help others. That was your self-care. And so you may have, after an event, went home from, on a high. <laughs> this is beautiful. <laughs> right. Laid down and cried. Because I'm still not really dealing with my stuff. Exactly. I wasn't. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. But I felt like focusing on something else mm-hmm. was allowing me to deal. But mm-hmm. I really wasn't. Mm-hmm. I was still... Present for others. We do that because that's how we mask sometimes until that doesn't really work the same. So you choose something else, meditation, running, a new job, another degree, Dr. Nicole. (laughs) I mean, you just keep going and going and doing, you know, the grandkids, your your family, going back to St. Louis, your grounding, your footing. Sometimes you need to feel that dirt under your feet because it creates that healing space for you. And sometimes that's all you need. It's like a little sip of what we used to take Robitussin back in the day, you know, just a little cup full of something. something. (laughs) (laughs) And then you get to a space where those things aren't working. And so I always say to people, when you've done all you can do, how about let's just take the risk that involves setting an appointment and showing up. Like people think it's the simplest thing, but it's one of the hardest things you can do. It was because. It was like I was having to admit something that I had pushed aside for so long to say. I mean, I thought I was doing, but I'm like, no, I really need to talk to someone. And my thing is this, I always say to people, like you said, I always thought that I was doing okay. And you were. You just need more now. It's elevated as life is, as trauma gets. I'm still learning me. Absolutely. And when do you want to stop that? What date? That's on a daily. <laughs> uh-huh. I always tell people, I don't want to stop learning me. Yeah. I don't plan I know. to. Yeah. Because we arrive. I don't know where. <laughs> I don't. Because when you get that kind of diagnosis, I don't care where you've arrived. It still knocks you off your block. It knocks you off, which is why that suffering in silence is for me, one of the saddest things I can see and feel from people. That often causes me to speak up, whether I'm at the salon or at work or in the community or anywhere. People will tell you everywhere I go, somebody's like, you're just talking to strangers all the time. 
I just can't help it. And sometimes it's not interruptive. It's a conversation, but it's something that sparks me to say, hey, tell me more about. Yeah. I mean, because I even was afraid to come to you to talk about my heaviness. Yeah. yeah. It's weird, but that's how we are. I mean, all of us and are you wired knew, like that. Like, mm-hmm. I know this I weight has to be, mm-hmm. but I couldn't talk about it. And I've learned not to force that. But we family members. They force because they love they you so love much. They love you. They love you so much. They it's love just, you. It's hard. I know going through a divorce and losing my mother at the same time. And I say at the same time because literally it was in the That's same trauma. months. It's traumatic. Yes. Layered. Complex. Layered. Yes. So my focus was my children, of course, and finances and some shame. Not a lot associated with divorce. My sadness from not having my, what I call life partner in terms of my mother, my sister, my girlfriend, my confidant, my prayer warrior, my supporter. Even if I'm wrong, when she got through talking to me, correcting me, I still didn't feel wrong. Like, (laughs) because it was just so genuine and 100 all the time, knowing that that was no longer available. And that's rare to have. Oh, it's rare to have. One of the things I had to understand, a girlfriend told me, she said, a lot of people lose their parents and it's crushing. It is crushing. But she said, but your mom was a different type of parent. She was available to the community. I saw it my whole life. I saw it my whole life. She said, but it's nothing she wouldn't have done for you. And your relationship with her is one that most people wanted most people envy. And it helped me talking to her, not suffering in silence, utilizing my friends who basically said at the time, hey, what's going on here? And I just said to her, I think I can't breathe. I'm breathing. I'm walking. I'm talking. I'm making it through my day. I'm making sure my kids are, my daughter was in high school at the time and I'm trying to navigate that. And her feelings and emotions about losing grandma and mom and dad not being together. And so you kind of put you back, right? And my girlfriend, who I've known most of my life, said, yeah, but your relationship with your mom was not a regular one. It wasn't a normal. It was beyond that. And so it made sense to me. But I had to open up in order to receive. Just them sentences from her healed me so much. When you choose not to be silent about your pain. Excuse me, I got my tear going. That's it's okay. All, it's all real. That's okay. Or your confusion about the pain. Yeah. And I, I know it depends on who you share with. Yeah. I just happened to be sharing with somebody who kind of looked at me like, thank you. Someone who really knows you, which mate, it gets on my nerves. <laughs> I'm going to tell you the truth. But you really know me. You really think you know something. They do. The people who love me know me. They know when I'm making it through something, but kind of covering or trying to not deal. You think my family knows that I've covered for so long? I think we should talk to them about that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Because I would give them like a surface answer. Like, you just don't know. Yeah. You just don't know what I have to do. Yeah. I would never actually dig in. And it took me a little bit to even kind of go with my sister to share with her. Yeah. I was like, and I still haven't been able to unpack it with my sister. Like, yeah. Well, one of the things is you haven't really unpacked it with yourself. Ugh. So th- let me tell you about that complexity. If you haven't unpacked it for self, you can't spread it out for others. It's kind of like I'm coming to your house for dinner, right? And all your nice dishes are still in the box in the garage. So if you don't know where they at, you can't set that out for me. You haven't even used them. <laughs> that's like the best china mm-hmm. that's in the cabinet. Mm-hmm. It looks pretty. <laughs> mm-hmm. But for what? What is that about that we have to present? Well, what does that even look like? Because what I've learned through therapy and through providing therapy is that we are our most deliciousness. We are our most delicious selves when we are transparent with self. That doesn't mean run your business to everybody. That doesn't mean every family member will understand. True. Very true. It does not. Very, very true. It does not. But they do love you. And if you gift them, G-I-F-T, 
the opportunity to hear you. Mm. You may be surprised. How do I do that? You just have to start. Hey, sis, I'm in therapy. I'm learning some things about myself. I just want to let you know that if you have any questions, it's not so much about telling, but allowing that invitation. If you have any questions or anything you want to talk to me about, or you feel that, and this is the big girl panties, right? Since my diagnosis, I haven't specifically been available to talk to you Ooh, about it. Man. I will Ooh. apologize for that because <laughs> I is, love this you. This is our therapy session right yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. I'll apologize because I love you. And I never held back from you to hurt you. I just couldn't. I'm still learning myself. I'm still learning so much. And it shook my very foundation. One of the things that those types of diagnosis do, what trauma does, is it shakes up everything you thought you knew. <laughs> Your entire foundation is off kilter. Yeah. Literally. Literally. Those, I think about Joe Biden. I don't know why this is came to <laughs> here. And his response to George Floyd and his family and the verdict the other day, but also yeah. how he processes what he believes Americans need. One of the things that I understand about him is that he has gone through horrific, yes. traumatic loss. So much trauma. Yes. Horrific. So And much. it doesn't make him greater than anybody else. Yeah. But it makes him more connective, tangible. Yeah. You know what it's like to have some hurt, mm-hmm. some pain, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Loss. Loss. Guilt. Shame. Yeah. To trust, to try to love again, what that looks like to try to go to work every day after that, to be present for those that didn't pass away. Talk about suffering in silence. I can't even imagine on... Overwhelming. Yeah. It's overwhelming. Yeah. There's so many Joe Bidens in the world. (laughs) People who have gone through things, they either come out of it on the other end, whole and complete and rejuvenated with another opportunity to live this life very differently. Or they're suffering in silence, oftentimes self-harming, mm-hmm. which is why Uh-oh. it's a negative to oh, suffer in yeah, silence. Gonna, I'm going to hit you with something uh-huh. on that. Because okay, we can go into self-harm yeah. easily. Yeah, We can also be gone in that space of depression, Yeah, pertinent, heavy depression for a very long time. We can be masking. And one of the things we know about the mind, body, and soul one being, is that if something is harming you mentally, it is definitely affecting you physically. And if something is harming you physically, cancer, diabetes, high blood pressure, being overweight, being underweight, whatever, it also can affect you mentally. And most often it does. We are one body. And so the very fact that we think we can get a diagnosis of cancer for the second time, I'm going to bring you home, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. More progressive, more scary, more dangerous, right? More life-threatening. And still move about our day the way we did the day before we found out. It's insane. But we do it (laughs) every day. Every day. I still got a 2.30 meeting. Do you know what you just heard yesterday? Yeah. 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 Do you know what you just went through yeah. yesterday? Uh, we don't have a 2.30 meeting. But we do this every day. We suffer in this type of silence because we don't know what to do with it. We don't know what to do with the diagnosis, the pain, the trauma. We don't. And so we hold it like it's money or we hold it like it's a treasure. Yeah. Or the biggest secret in the world. You hold it so tight. The biggest secret. And so when people nudge you and say, hey, how are you? I'm good. (laughs) Do you need anything? Oh, no. Do you, though? I can help you because I am still Nicole. I think the pandemic and us having been separated (laughs) caused a lot of shifts. Oh, yeah. 
It shut I mean, people down. Honey. I mean, you're dealing with that isolation. You're at the crib. You're really having to deal with you. You're okay? at the crib. <laughs> you don't watch everything. The first seven months, we watched everything, okay? And there's what else can you do? Yeah. Now you got to really deal with yourself, right? So here I am. I know. Thank God. And the journey is yours. And I'm thanking you for coming along with me. It's beautiful. It's all beautiful and it's all purposeful and it's all specifically on time. It's specifically on time. I don't want people to have regrets about what they should have done. What benefit do we have out of thinking, Simone, you should have did this yesterday? I knew that. Now what? Now what? I'm doing it today. That's a great thing to kind of bring it on home, like Mm -hmm. you said. Mm -hmm. So what would you... Share with the audience and tell them who are suffering in silence, not even just a cancer patient. Mm -hmm. What is it that you can share to tell someone, number one, that you're not alone in this thing? You don't have to suffer in silence. What can you tell us as a trauma therapist to help get us onto that next path? Well, you said it. The importance is that people understand that suffering in silence creates a space for you and only you. So you live in that space with the trauma and the two of you (laughs) become this thing. It's never a good thing. Not you and the trauma. Maybe you and the trauma and support. You and the trauma and some loved ones. You and the trauma and therapy. Bring something in to support you because the trauma is so enormous. The trauma is so massive and heavy, heavy foot, that we say to people, you're not bipolar. You suffer with bipolar disorder. I am schizophrenic. You're not schizophrenic. That's a whole nother topic. (laughs) Listen, listen. Yeah. You're not only a person who has, you're not a human trafficked. You have suffered through and experienced human trafficking. You are not stage four cancer or any cancer. You're not. And so when you stay in a space where you suffer in silence, you are dancing with the trauma. Y'all in spaces together. Always. The bathroom, the closet, the work, car. Always. It's here. You hear triggers. Triggers. Stuff on TV about cancer. I watch Law and Order all the time. <laughs> so people get triggers from shows, from movies, from friends, from coworkers. If I'm driving past the dialysis place here in Milwaukee, my stomach hurts today because my mother was on dialysis in Beloit. And so every time I think about kidney issues or dialysis, my stomach hurts. That is a trigger. It reminds me of her no longer being on the planet with me, right? And so I'm not covering up the fact that that's a trigger. I know what it is. And so I recognize it when I see dialysis clinic on the building or somebody is talking about kidney failure and I breathe. I know what it is. Call a thing a thing and know that it wasn't designed to take you out. (laughs) <laughs> it wasn't designed to take you out. Right. It's designed to shape you, to make you, to mold you. Look, I was going to say that's some I heck of a shaping. It's okay. some shaping. <laughs> it is some, some shaping. Heck of a molding. And who wants that? Who wants to get knocked around, moved around? But I'm telling you, when you're in that thing with your trauma and it's just you and your trauma, the trauma kind of takes over. It kind of clouds your vision. You see through the lens of the trauma. I see through the lens of a survivor of cancer. I see through the lens of being a divorcee. Yeah. Right? You see through the lens of that. And it's okay to have it accessible, available to you, to give you a larger perspective. Yes. Dr. Nicole, than what you had prior to the diagnosis. So your perspective on pain, trauma, suffering, cancer, breast, yeah, lingerie, wig, yeah, beauty. Your perspective is different now. Totally different. Because that is why trauma, I believe, 
is introduced to our lives so that our perspective widens, so that we can help other people. The only reason we're here is to be with other people and to help. That's the only reason. I ain't here to be doctors. Wow. Can you think everybody could take on that? Just embrace that, that it shapes us. Everybody might not look at it that they way. They definitely but it, don't. But we know it does. It does. There's in no way possible that it doesn't. We spend too much time with it. And so when you suffer in silence, you don't allow for it to process and for you to say, mm, I can do this with that and I can change it this way and I can seek help this way and I can try this and I might not like therapy. That's okay. <laughs> Some people, they want to argue all the time about therapy ain't for everybody. It's not. Yes. It's just not. Yes. That's okay. Yes. Okay. I'm not arguing. But if you have to seek it, uh-huh. it's okay. Mm-hmm. And if you try it first and then that's your perspective, that's different because you put your foot in the water. But if you never tried therapy, if you never tried to come out of that silent space, yeah. then you don't know the benefits. You cannot know the possible benefits if you don't try. Now, if people try and they tell me, eh, I say, did you try another therapist? Did you try a white man, an Asian man, a Latino woman, a black woman, a young person, an older person, somebody in Aruba? Did you try <laughs> telehealth? <laughs> try everything, okay? Yeah. I mean, just don't take my word or somebody else's word. Try what you need to try for you because once you put your foot in the water, it might not be that cold. I mean, and that's how therapy works, right? And it opens you up to... Wow, I never knew that I processed this that way. Oh, I didn't see it from that angle or this angle or that angle. Oh, now that you say that, maybe that therapy group for women who deal with this type of diagnosis, I don't have to talk, I can attend. Oh, okay. And so it opens you up to new ideas and new avenues of healing. I always do my fingers like this because therapy is a start, but then it, it opens up new avenues of healing. There could be a running group. There could be somebody who wants to be a donor for hats for heart. Yeah. <laughs> but if you suffering alone and you're not opening up, who oh no. Yeah. Yeah. Avenue for healing. It's an avenue. That's perfect because I want it. The Sisters Saving Sisters podcast to be all about conversations that heal. Yes, absolutely. I'm a firm believer and we have to heal in order to experience the life that we are gifted with. I feel like there's so many people on the planet, whether it's from trauma or other things, that really don't experience living, breathing. Yeah. The beauty I always say to my kids, why do you think God made so many different flowers with different scents and different colors? Like, why aren't they all yellow tulips? (laughs) Why do we have a variety (laughs) for us to pay attention to? He didn't do it for him. It's for us to pay attention to the diversity within you. That's beautiful. And the diversity within me. And for me to be sitting with a woman who's been diagnosed twice. You are a walking miracle and people should be able to experience you. Oh, my gosh. They should be able to experience you for hope. You are gorgeous. Drop dead gorgeous. Oh, always have been. But so kind. who would ever think <laughs> cancer? Who would ever look at you and think that you went through what you went through? Nobody. And that alone, that alone, I just don't want to cry, but that alone is going to help people. That's what I'm hoping this does. Oh, yeah. I'm so glad you're taking this journey with me. Absolutely. And just helping me open this up. Absolutely. This is a phenomenal idea. (laughs) This is it. I thank you for being, I'm like, you, I have to help me more. (laughs) Anything you need from me, anytime. No, no. Anytime. I don't know how like to wrap it up, but I just (laughs) want to thank the audience Mm -hmm. who listened to us today. Sisters saving sisters, conversations that heal. I just want to thank from the bottom of my heart, Mm -hmm. my sister, Simone, you are so amazing. You're amazing. You are so amazing. Look, having the conversations behind the chair and for sitting with me. This has been my own session. I'm like, I've been trying to pull it together, like uh, (laughs) my tears. But I just want to say thank you. And I, I just want to encourage people, our listeners, to like us, to subscribe to your favorite podcast, mm-hmm. follow us, and look for us on Facebook as we 
share our conversation. Yes, please do. Thank you again. Thank you guys for joining us. Until the next time, Sister Saving Sisters, Conversations That Heal. Thank you so much. Thank you. Love you. Love you. Thank you for taking this journey with us. Subscribe or follow us in your favorite podcast app. Until next time, stay encouraged.